Monitor Eating Office Cat. Small office customer sold a new bezel-less 24-inch LCD monitor to said customer. Customer takes it on site and hooks it up. All works well. It sits on a counter by a large window. Customer calls me a few days later, says the new monitor's dead. The power light's on, but no signal. I haven't tried a different cable, different port on the PC, etc., but nothing. So we process a replacement, swap it out, and chalk it up to being DOA. Customer calls me again a few days later still, says, you're not going to believe this, but the second new monitor is doing the same thing as the first. At this point, I'm thinking their office must have a power problem or something that's killing monitors, but I decide I'll take a truck roll and see for myself. I go on site and bring a third new monitor with me just in case. I open the door and see a very pretty cat walking on the floor. I look at the old original monitor, which was replaced by the new 24 inch. It's an old 17 inch LCD from a decade ago and had thick beefy bezels as monitors from that era did. I see some bite marks at the top corners, but they're just on the bezel so no actual screen damage. It's beginning to add up now. Their office cat had been chewing the corners of the old thick bezeled monitor, which was fine until they got a new monitor that had no bezels at all and it looks like it was one bite from the cat to pierce the LCD itself. Twice. Once they were made aware, it was easy to see the teeth marks in the corner of the LCD of the new monitor. Customer ended up getting a used 22-inch monitor with thick bezels. Cat still chews the corners. Edit. I found the pics. Let's take a look. Oh dear. Just enough. Just enough to get that... Mm. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's definitely a cat bite. Down below in the comments, catastrophic outcome. You should really thank that cat for drumming up repeat business. What's up guys, welcome back to Storytime with Uncle John. Today we're taking a look at r slash Tales from Tech Support. Sorry, it's been a little while, like a week and a half plus, <laughs> sorry. I actually, last time I was at the bridge, I actually recorded a whole episode. Got completely done to check, uh, to, check to make sure the files were okay before I put it in the editor and realized that I only recorded audio no video. So I could have done the podcast for that day, but you know, I like to do both. I like to keep things matchy matchy, up to date, even Steven, all that, you know, stuff. Anyway, got some news for everybody. Nothing major for you guys, but it's major for me. Uh, we're going to be moving soon. So again, this whole setup's going to change again, which, you know, you're not, you're not shocked about that really, are you? I mean, I change up my video backgrounds as much as I, well, maybe not quite as much as I change my drawers, but you know, TMI. So the videos are going to be, you know, sporadic at best, which they have been anyway the last few episodes, uh, but they are still coming. Point number two is the soap business. Uh, and by the way, this video is going to be sponsored by me, Uncle John, UncleJohnSoap.com. More about that later on. But anyway, we're going to be relocating. And uh, so we're going to have to, we pick some dates that we're going to stop production for a couple weeks and stop shipping things. You know, the website's always active and available. You can still order stuff, but there's going to be a certain date range that when you order things, uh, they're just not going to ship, at least in time for Christmas. They'll get out, but it's going to take a little while. It's going to drag on a little bit extra. Not that we're fast to begin with. We're a small, mostly one-person operation, sometimes two, and I'm the slacker, of course. But anyway, so I'll tell you more about that at the end of the video. All right, next story. Yelling at IT staff does not a business continuity plan make. I actually said that word right. <laughs> Shocker. This is from a few years ago. I was working at a medium-sized company as an IT sysadmin. The company had just recently moved to a new location that was able to more comfortably accommodate its operation. It had an on-site call center as well as a medium-scale manufacturing and repair center. Since we were new tenants and everyone was now under one roof, many things were still being figured out. One day we got a notice of a gas leak in the manufacturing area. We didn't have an alarm system for a gas leak, so people were running around telling everyone else that there was a mandatory evacuation of the building. The IT people all had laptops, so we all grabbed them and made our way to our cars. By coincidence, our director of IT and the head of IT support were on a business trip. As I'm walking out the door, the call center director, I'll call him Cal, started yelling at me and the other sysadmin. Hey, what are you guys going to do? Uh, go to our cars? No, you can't. We can't receive calls. You have to do something. I turned to my coworker, and we both realized that the call center still used desktop computers and soft phones. They couldn't do their job. Cal was red in the face trying to slowly let people out the door to the outside. It was then that the fire department arrived probably to clear out the building officially. So I asked Cal, what's your plan if there's a fire? Just do that? What? No, you need to do something. I shrugged. We can't do anything. The phone system probably doesn't work off a of VPN. I was guessing at that. Just follow your plan if there's a fire. 
You guys never gave us a plan for a fire, Cal responded. Because, of course, it's IT's job to develop a business continuity plan for the entire company. More people were streaming out. It was then that I decided to ignore him and go to my car. I tried to call the director of IT, and the slim chance the airplane diverted or was delayed. No answer. I looked up in the company SharePoint site for a business continuity plan or a fire plan or something. But only found stuff for IT, including our off-site backup servers and how to run IT operations from a VPN. There was nothing about moving our soft phones to or through a VPN. Cal knocked on my car window after everyone was out of the building. And he says, well... I explained that there was no business continuity plan in the SharePoint site, and IT didn't have anything in place to shift soft phones to VPN. Plus, we didn't have enough laptops to support even half the call center. Cal didn't like my answer, and walked over to the CEO who was with the fire department. I could see Cal pointing at me and yelling. Clearly, we were losing business, and clearly, it wasn't just IT's fault. It was mine, and mine alone. The fire department cleared us to go back in after about 45 minutes. Later that day, I had two meetings with Cal and the COO scheduled. Since IT was missing both leadership positions to travel, I was the scapegoat. The first meeting was canceled, and the second, the CEO stepped in and canceled it since it was really the job of the director of IT, and a lowly sysadmin shouldn't be in these meetings. Nothing bad happened to me when the IT director returned, and the company hired a consultant to develop an actual business continuity plan for fires, weather, and other events. Turned out IT shouldn't have a button they could press in the event of a gas leak. For several months, Cal scowled at me after that every time we passed in the hall. Well, not only does Cal sound like a real joy to be around in the work environment, he sounds like a total D-bag um, because he doesn't understand how business works. If I have a construction company, and that's kind of where my brain functions best, and I'm running a job site, am I going to put it on, you know, the, the general laborer who's hired to sweep floors, carry materials, you know, make, make material runs in the company truck, things like that? Am I going to put it on his head to make sure scheduling happens and, you know, if something happens to either me or the superintendent or something like that, that he takes over. There's like, he's the, he's the guy, he's the backup guy to go to so that you can, you know, get a hold of the architect, the engineers, you know, figure out what problems we're having with engineering and overlay plans, whatever. I, I just don't understand why that would be a thing. Now, first of all, it would be my problem if I didn't have a plan in place of some sort, or if I wasn't the owner of the company or the head honcho, it would be above my pay grade for them to set up some sort of plan or to pay me to set it up, whatever. But, you know, if that plan is not in place, it doesn't fall to the lowest guy on the rung. Hell, it doesn't even fall on middle management at that point. They're just, they're given the SOP and <laughs> that's what they work from. Now, if they have ideas, they can take them to upper management, but that doesn't mean that, you know, they're supposed to set it up. Cal just sounds like a loser who likes to point fingers and blame everybody else. Good thing that never really happens, huh? The customer who didn't understand turning it off and on again. I work in tech support for a fairly large company and I've had my fair share of bizarre calls, but this one really stuck with me. A customer calls in and the first thing I notice is that they're clearly frustrated. I ask for details and they explain that their computer is just frozen and nothing's working. I tell them as calmly as possible, no worries, let's start by rebooting the computer. Please hold the power button for 10 seconds to turn it off and then turn it back on. There's a pause on the line, then the customer says, I don't know how to do that. I say, you don't know how to turn off your computer? The customer says, no, I don't know where the power button is. Oh dear. I'm trying to stay professional at this point, so I walk them through it. I even ask them if they can find the power button on the actual device. They respond that they don't see one. So I ask, can you look on the side or the back of the computer for a button or a logo? The customer says, it doesn't have one. At this point, I'm a little confused, but I decide to walk them through the process anyway. I start asking if they can see any lights on the device. They tell me no, nothing's lighting up. Then it hits me. I ask, are you sure you're working with a computer? The customer says, well, no, I'm looking at my microwave. <laughs> what? <laughs> this person had been trying to reboot a microwave for 30 minutes, thinking it was their computer. After a long, awkward silence, I confirmed that microwaves don't have the same functionality as computers and recommended they try restarting the actual computer instead. They were extremely apologetic and I just couldn't stop laughing after I hung up. Never a dull moment in tech support, folks. Stay strong out there. Okay, the older we get, the stranger things become. I get that. I watched my parents, my in-laws, they're all, some, some have gone through it and gone on to greater things to the afterlife. And some are starting to go through it now or have been for the last couple of years and things are progressing. It can be sad. It can be frustrating. 
it can also be extremely funny. Uh, you know, if I found out my father-in-law was standing there trying to reboot his microwave instead of his computer, it would be hard not to laugh. And I'm sure I could probably make him laugh too, but you know. Oh dear. See what we all have to look forward to? Life is great. Hmm. 8,300 lines of dependent code to, drumroll please, create one record. For context, this is a project I was called into as an emergency resource. Basically, come fix our mistakes. Anyways. Oh yeah, just found this one recently. One transaction runs 170 lines of code to verify the creation of a single record across three to four classes. Not sure what that means. The total line count of those classes and their corresponding test class is just over 8,300 lines of code. One of the classes on its own is over 2,400. I saw a method that had over 300 lines just on its own. What a trooper. The first kicker, well, maybe not. There's a lot of great stuff in here. Eight layer if else statements. Okay, one of my favorites is that the Big Mama class is a global class and is integrated with an external system. This system, as evident by dozens of unnecessary permission clicks, can have multiple users hitting this class at the same time. That's a real problem because every single method is static and the source records are stored as global static variables. For those who may be unaware or just unfamiliar, static, thank you, means that there cannot be multiple instances of that variable even if multiple things are referencing that method or variable. In other words, if you have two requests come in at the same time, you could very easily end up swapping the source records mid-process and corrupting the data on one or both sets of data. I sorta of got that. And you would never know because while corrupted, all the data is likely still in a valid format and will pass through the system without a system error. Kind of a big deal when it's directly associated to every deal in your sales process. But the thing that really prompted me to post this was such a level of, I don't care about the next guy, that I'm actually stunned. I think I may be in denial still. There is a class, and he's amazing. We know the rules. Don't hard code values that are susceptible to change. If at all possible, and reasonable, don't hard code a constant that may change in the future. This class, I shit you not, is just shy of 500 lines of grade A organic non-GMO constants, baby. They're global, they're hard coded, and they're susceptible to change. But that wasn't enough. It's the gift that keeps on giving. After spending the better part of 12 hours wishing I was dragging my head across the pavement at high speeds, <laughs> I noticed the comment at the top of the code, slightly paraphrased. Class to hold the static values, to avoid hard coding. Oh dear. Sometimes, man, I really do wonder. I feel like I have done a pretty good job of remaining positive about this absolute mess of a transaction. But why they gotta spit in my face like that? It's hard coded for 500 consecutive lines right below that message. That's exclusively what this class is. Come on, man, just damn. Final bit of context, because I don't know what everyone's familiar with, this platform has built-in functionality for getting the exact values at the time of running. There isn't a single thing in that constants class that needs to be declared as a hard set constant in the code. And there are no checks to verify that the transaction ID remains constant or consistent, sorry. I don't know what half of that meant, but I do know that the guy did contradict himself to avoid hard coding when he actually hard coded everything. Before screw guns became, or drills, cordless drills and all that stuff became extremely popular in framing anything on a job site, uh, even before nail guns, uh, and even during the beginning of nail gun usage, we would do temporary bracing and things like that. And usually we would either not set the nail completely or only use a couple nails just to make sure that we could get things apart without a whole lot of hassle. Still strong enough to hold things up, but you know, not crazy. If you were really lucky, you had a, what we, I don't know, I always referred to them as Mason's nails because it was a double-headed nail, which meant that when you made the head hit, it would still hold your board on really tight, but you had a little bit of uh, excess nail sticking up with another head that you could grab with a pry bar or hammer or whatever to pull it apart. Invariably, we would put a temporary brace up and we had this one wild guy on one of our crews that would just go absolutely nuts. So, you know, we'd tell him to nail something, you know, nail the brace so that things would stay up. Instead of putting two nails in each end gently and all that, he would nail it solid. And he would, he would angle his nails so that they were dug in and they wouldn't, you know, the board wouldn't possibly slide off the nails or pull out or things like that. And, you know, when you come around to start taking bracing off so that you can do the next phase, whether it's exterior sheathing, interior drywall, insulation, whatever... Uh, yeah, it was always an extra chore to get this guy's bracing apart. So yeah, something's supposed to be temporary. You got to make sure it's actually temporary. If it's meant to be changed, you got to make it changeable. 
things like that. Am I getting close to this? Am I am I way off base with this? I don't know. Anyway, you know me. Santa Flaws. In days gone by, there was a project to refresh our site. Pallets upon pallets of kit arrived. Desktops, monitors, as many as our storeroom could take. Desks were stripped and rebuilt. So shiny, so new, so uniform, so factory default. It had a certain unblemished beauty akin to thick, level-setted snow. Settled. Snow. Are we going to refresh the network cabling too, I ask? Thinking of the decades of old Cat5 poking out through holes run directly from the server room. Not a single RJ45 wall socket in sight. The response I receive only adds to the Christmas card-like image in my head. The absolute crisp, delicate serenity of acoustically insulated silence. Santa visits often and is generous. Boxes arrive. Boxes are opened. Boxes are sorted for recycling. Some of the boxes are different to others. Some are flatter. Some are heavier. These boxes arrive. These boxes are not opened. These boxes are set aside in the corner. Santa's been at it quite a while now. We must be the goodest and bestest boys and girls in the world. Boxes arrive. Boxes are opened. Boxes are sorted for recycling. Is Santa going to keep coming all year, I ask? Aware of the quantity we're accumulating. Such exquisite, pristine silence. Boxes arrive. Boxes are no longer opened. Boxes fill up our storeroom. PCs are ready to be imaged. So exciting. All the new toys. So new and so perfect. So delightfully fresh and identical. So full of baseline known condition. Uncompromised promise. Images deploy. Oh no. Such strange and erratic behavior. Intermittent faults and discrepancies. If only we had gone for the network cabling refresh. What a sad little disappointment on the happiest day of the year. I think all is not well with Santa either. Boxes arrive. Boxes are shunted straight into stores. Boxes pile high. We're given the schedule for several more weeks of deliveries. What are we going to do with all this equipment, I ask concerned. The snow is beginning to turn a little yellow. Yet still, there is silence. Maybe something's wrong with Santa. I write Santa a short letter. Santa replies that this is none of my business and to mind my own. Oh dear. I'm sad that Santa would speak to me this way, when up to now he's been nothing but generous. I write Santa a longer letter this time, one with a count of the total number of desks on site, the number already set up, and the number of kits in storage compared to the number of empty desks. Santa calls me immediately. Uh, are those numbers right? Santa and I become close friends. He calls me every week now. He only wants to talk numbers and dates for deliveries though. For many, many weeks we only talk about the same numbers again and again and I tell him he's been far, far too kind. Surely there must be other good children in the world as well. I begin to suspect Santa only wants to talk to me so he can tell all the other Santas who to speak to if they find out their generosity was misguided. One of the other Santas writes a letter to me. Santa too is very worried he's missed us off his list. Santa too wants to know if we received an extra special box. I tell him we have that very special box, yes. What about the other boxes, I ask, wondering about the tower of switches in the very far corner of the storeroom. No one said we can open those yet. Silent night. I count again the number of desks in the entire building and divide by 48. Oh no, Santa. We've been sent far too many of these boxes. There must be several good boys and girls with their own sites that didn't get their switches by mistake. Several. These can't possibly be all for us. I'm worried about Santa too now. I write a letter to Santa and Santa too about the switches. Santa was on a temporary contract and doesn't Santa for us anymore. Oh, Santa didn't even say goodbye. Santa too didn't say anything about the switches. This time I write a letter to six or seven Santas. Why do we have X times 48 switch ports for a site with Y number of endpoints? Santa too calls me straight away. Um, can you send me a photo of them? This is one of the stories that I read the other day when I was at the bridge and uh, recorded the entire episode uh, with audio only. So it feels good to kind of read this story and actually have the video to go along with the audio. Yes, it's running. Had to make sure. Anyway, one of the things we used to do, our, our construction team, our company, we used to build fast track restaurants. So think, you know, anything from fast food, Burger Kings, uh, BK Expressways, Checkers Hamburger Places, things like that. We did do a couple Sonics. I don't know if they count. We only did a couple of them. But anyway, up to, you know, higher class restaurants. Well, higher class more sit down meals, you know, think Applebee's, TGI Fridays, things like that. Uh, and you know, every restaurant had a corporate package for trim, uh, booths, tables, decorations, lighting, you name it. What, whatever the finished product was that you saw when you walked into the dining area of these restaurants was usually sent on a couple of tractor trailers. 
and it was counted out usually very carefully and separated in their warehouses. And then we'd have, you know, Connex containers on site to go ahead and place the stuff to store until we were ready to install it. All pre-stained, pre-painted for the most part. Some of the stuff would get touched up or repainted and, you know, no big deal. One of these jobs we were doing was a combination. Uh, it was a Grady Steakhouse and something else. It was like two restaurants that were adjoined inside. You could get to one, from one to the other indoors. Um, but anyway, didn't really matter. Both of them had corporate packages. The one came, nothing, no problem. All those, all the trim packages and tables and booths and cushions and lights and decorations and all that stuff. No worries. The count was right. Then the packages started arriving for the second site and everything was right. But the problem is the next day we got another tractor trailer load and then another one and then another one. And okay, we thought that was it. Sent an email off waiting for a response. We got way too much of this stuff. We ordered a couple more Connex boxes so that we could put this stuff off to the side and wait for somebody to come pick it up. Two days after that, still no response, but we get two more tractor trailer loads of the finish for the restaurant. To say that I was confused is just putting it way too mildly. It ended up that this company decided it was going to be cheaper to not even pick the stuff up. And I don't know. I think somebody, I think one of the people that owned that particular franchise ended up finding somebody to buy all the stuff. I don't know. I don't want to know. It probably walked off the site and somebody lost a ton of money in their job. But I think it's funny how one slip of a pencil, pen, keystroke, if you're doing it computerized, back in the day, a lot of that stuff used to be done by hand, all the requisitioning and stuff. One little slip up <laughs> by an architect or a supervisor or somebody, somebody who's in charge of you know, purchasing and supplying, whatever. One little slip up can mean probably hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of misplaced product. And then it's gonna cost you a ton of money to get it transferred back or whatever. And of course, all my time got wasted trying to de you know, detail all this in a report and you know, figure out how much we were over and get everything separated so we had our original trim package for the building, make sure it stays separate so that nothing happens to that. And then also figure out the inventory of whatever else was sent to us. I'm, I'm, I'm talking several days with probably eight of us shuffling things around and finding labels and ta you know, taking pictures of it and logging it down. And, you know, then they want to, you know, complain about us because we're, you know, a week behind on the job. Well, duh, you just took me and my carpenters, you know, off the job basically to, you know, count inventory for you. Yeah, people are amazing. So while I don't have a good segue for this, this episode is sponsored by me, Uncle John, UncleJohnSoap.com. If you like handmade stuff like, you know, soaps, bath products, traditional shave soaps. No, I don't shave. It doesn't mean I can't make a good shave soap. Anyway, beard balms, beard oils, mustache wax. If you want to shape that thing, you know, get a little nice little handlebar going. I'm too lazy. I like the look, but I'm just too lazy to do it. If you like that kind of stuff, though, go ahead and visit our website, UncleJohnSoap.com. And from now until December 20th, you're going to get 15% off no matter what you order. With one caveat, you can only order up to December 10th for guaranteed Christmas delivery. And I say guaranteed loosely because I can't really control the U.S. Post Office but we'll give it a shot. But if you order anything from now until December 10th, we'll try our best to get it there by Christmas in case it's a gift. And if you put in the comments, you can leave a comment in the little box at checkout, you know, that this is Christmas gifts or whatever. Uh, let us know so that maybe we can put priority on things a little bit, you know, maybe swap some orders, you know, production around so that we can get those out first and maybe get those ones out as we can. Anyway, if you order after the 10th, the, the website will stay live. You can place orders anytime. But after the 10th, there's no guarantee it'll get there by Christmas. And we're going to also shut down production. I don't remember. I have the date somewhere here in front of me. Let me take a look. Okay, so what it looks like we're doing is we're going to set up for basically starting to close that down production and actually actively working on orders after December 10th sometime. 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, somewhere in there. We're going to have to stop everything so that we can pack up the shop and start moving it. That means it's going to be difficult for us to make anything, to ship anything. It's just going to be, it's going to be a wild ride. You know, we're selling this house. We're buying another house. We have a shop set up at the other place. Well, the structure's there, but until I sign the papers, they're not going to let us move in early. So anyway, actually, it's not even the signing of the papers. They want their money. Can't blame them. So anyway, expect things to slow down after the 10th as far as shipping out goes. Your order will still go out. It'll be a little slow. Sorry about that ahead of time. Any orders 
up to the 10th and beyond up until December 20th, you're going to get 15% off at checkout if you use promo code HOHOHO15. Should be easy to remember. Just go ahead and place that in the coupon code box. And uh, as usual, if you order over $125 worth of products, you will get free shipping. So anyway, keep all that stuff in mind. And uh, we really appreciate your support and your business. And uh, we appreciate the fact that you guys enjoy our product. So don't forget, visit that website right down there and uh, use promo code HOHOHO15 to get 15% off your entire order. And uh, have a Merry Christmas. I'll be making videos between now and then, so this isn't the last time you're going to see me. It's not even Thanksgiving yet. But anyway, you know, I get busy, and sometimes the videos are going to be spaced a little further apart than they should be. All right, guys, till the next one, we'll see you. Ho, ho, ho.